We work with the driveway uh, configuration, making it a little bit more uh, organic and a nicer feel for the community. We have a turnaround up here, and we have uh, uh, parking incorporated uh, up here in the corner of the lot. Our highest priority here will be this uh, terrace that we will create in front of the building with a hardscape. We haven't chosen materials yet. We don't know what that would be or exactly how that would fit together, but we have the concept. We have a hardscape up here, some water feature, some uh, plants, and some grass with a wall, memorial wall over here. Step down from that. You've got a retaining wall where we can sell niches. There would be seating. Step down from that would be another uh, terrace as well. And then that steps down into the expanse of the lawn. We have, uh, and we obviously do a lot of use the lawn for parking. We can, we'll still be able to do that. We have this area to your left as you pull in off the street that would still be a small activity site or parking and this large expanse for program. When I say program, it's like our lawn party that we'll be having here in July and I'll get to it in a moment. But that's very functioning so that you can have a tent there, you can have vintage cars, you can have a wedding there, and we actually have been approached to have weddings here. We have various phases that we can implement over time. We want uh, this expanse is quite large and rather formal and open. Over here on the west side of the lot, we have some uh, trees and other brush so that you have a, a more natural, more intimate feel over here. And this is a small memorial garden that we would have available as well with a retaining wall and steps down to the memorial space. All in told, what we, what we want to do uh, our vision is to make the Abbey as beautiful as she once was um, and to have a site that really feels like a park. doesn't feel like a cemetery, not that there's anything wrong with that, but we want this to be a park for the neighborhood. And we want people to feel that they can come here and have a wonderful experience and celebrate life just like we do every day. But to do it respectfully and to, do, and to have a really lovely setting. So that's what we set out to do. We've got a lot of work that we have to do in terms of raising money for the building and for the site. Phase one alone, which would be the turnaround here, this drive, parking, and this space up here is $300,000. The whole site altogether would be in the $800 to $1 million range. So we've got a lot of heavy lifting. We've got a lot of work to do. We really need support from the community. We'll be doing this and accomplishing this through donations, and with money raised, but also we'll be looking at um, implementing a business plan and we'll need some uh, probably uh, lending and some credit as well. So that's what we're looking to do. The success of the Abbey will rely on uh, a solid business plan. We've been working on that. We think the Abbey's beautiful. We think it's a real asset for the community. We got it listed on the National Register three years ago. It's on the National Register because it's such a good example of high, uh, high quality craftsmanship and quality design. It's considered an exceptional uh, example of funerary architecture, not just for Ohio, but for the nation as well. So uh, it's just, we're really quite fortunate. We have some famous people here internationally that I'm sure you've heard about and hear more about. Also, very important historically. Um, <clears throat> and so there's, there's a lot of, lot of layers of how we'll be interpreting uh, the Abbey and making it a place of life, as well as a place uh, that's respectful and a place that you want to come to for memorial services. Who has, does anyone here have a family member here interred in the Abbey? Tamara does. <laughs> We've got, and you do. Well, did you be sure to note that when you sign in? Because we want we want people who are descendants to know about what we're doing and to feel good about what we're doing, and absolutely give us feedback about what we're doing and how how um, that's coming. So we really welcome everyone. Um, and do you have any questions? It's a wonderful building. You've you've gone halfway through the tour. Uh, feel free to ask questions. We are having an event this summer 
we had Great Gatsby, it's a lawn party, and it's a great event. It's a wonderful event. We have vintage cars here. We have, it's a 1920s themed event. We have people in dress, period dress. We have period music. We'll have a tent, um, and we'll have farm to table, fresh food, and we really encourage everyone to come back. And buy a ticket, it helps re right. restore the Abbey. So I'm going to hand these out. Thank you. start over here. Oh, well, we'll start here because I want to show you the crip lift. As you go by in here, this is it. this is an original crip lift, um, and it works. Wow! It's a workhorse, let me tell you. So when you when you when you're ready to put somebody in a top shelf, they go on here and you crank that up. A couple people can ride up with it, and then of course they would put it in there. Most people never stayed to see that part. You know, after the service was done, it's kind of like most people don't stay to see the closing of the grave. If you moved a bundle of tobacco from one room in your house to another, you had to fill out a federal form. Now, his dad was a shopkeeper. He didn't have time for that nonsense. So basically, he said, boys, if you want to mess around with this, that's fine. He said, but I'm not going to do it. So Edward and his brother Rollin, who was buried right over there, started making cigars. And they started out on the road. He uh, was, went to Newark High School. And in the eighth grade, or he was in the eighth grade, was going to go to high school, and he said, I don't want to be bothered with that. He said, I know what I'm going to do. So he started making cigars, and they're still made today. His, his plant was basically where um, Veterans Memorial is now. It burned down in 1913, but he had, he had quite a business. It was right on the river, so he, he made his own electricity, so he didn't have to pay the city for that. He produced his own boxes for the cigars, and he hand manufactured the cigars. Over 3,000 people were employed for Swisher and Company in 1913 when the when it built, when it burned down. And that was his that was the worst day for him because all of those people were out of work. If you'll notice, his children uh, all died very young. When when they first started the business, him and his brother they rolled the cigars at home, and I don't know. Probably the manufacturing process was different then now than it is, you know, and so most of his children died from allergies to tobacco. Mm. But they didn't realize that until much later. This person, you may have never, ever, maybe never have heard his name, but I know that you know something about him. How many people know that there is a motion picture rating system? Everybody knows about that, right? PG-13 and uh, rated R or X, well, Max Stern is the father of the motion picture rating system. He owned the Ohio, th or not the Ohio Theater, the Southern Theater, and a couple of other, the Exhibit Theater, which was all silent movies. He preferred silent movies over talkies, 
and, and the Southern Theater was the very last theater to have sound put in. Um, but basically, how many people have ever seen the old movie King Kong with Fay Ray? You remember that? Well, there's a scene where King Kong has Fay Ray in his hand and he drops her and her blouse is ripped. And you see bare bosoms. <laughs> Max Stern was appalled that they would put such filth in a movie. <laughs> now, obviously, Max is spinning in his grave with some of the stuff you'd see in a movie today. But he told them, he sent it back. I mean, this was it, during the time. It was one showing, and one showing only, in his theater in Columbus. And his was the only theater showing it. Because he showed it, he saw it, and he said, that's filth, I'm not showing that again. He gave everybody their money back and never and just and would not show King Kong. King Kong was an Oscar winner. He didn't show that film. Max lost a lot of money on that. But he said he was a man of principle and he said, I will not show that film in my theater. So basically, all the producers would write on the can anything that would be objectionable to Max after that. So that he watched it first before he ever showed it in his theater. And if he sent it back, they knew that there was something wrong. And so they would say, if it's not good enough for Max, it's not good enough for us. So that's how the motion picture rating system came to be. <laughs> okay? You don't believe that? The first person, you know what, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I do know.